My name is Jose Ignacio. I'm a research technician from Swansea University in charge of controlling the microalgal biomass production process, together with my colleague Vanessa, in the photobioreactor located here in Langage AD in the south of England. And today I will show you the process of inoculation and control that we make for the microalgae culture. To begin with, this is the PBR we use in the project. It has a capacity of 7,500 liters to 800 liters at its maximum volume. It consists of a dark tank and seven modules, which we can control and divide into one, three or seven modules that is considered full PBR, depending on the needs of the culture. We also have a heating cooling system coupled with the tank in order to control the temperature of the culture. Finally, the PBR has artificial light installed in the modules which is used to increase the hours of light at times of the year when there is less sunlight such as winter. The final thing I will say about the PBR is that we have used the microalgae Chlorella vulgaris and Senedesmus obliquus. To start with the inoculation process, we must first scale up the microalgae in the laboratory, starting from 100 ml to 1 liter, which we adapt to increasing concentration of dye state from 0.5% to 2.5%. Once adapted in the laboratory, we proceed to the inoculation of 25 liters carboy, located in the greenhouse. This carboy will be used to inoculate 80 liter bags when the density is enough for scaling up. Finally, when we have the enough numbers of bags with the right density and liters of culture, we can start with the culture growing in the PBR. But before the PBR inoculation with the culture, we must first take a series of steps to avoid any kind of contamination. 24 hours before the inoculation, we use the membrane to filter the water that is added to the PBR. We add bleach to the water filter in the PBR and we leave it running for 24 hours. The next day, we add thiosulfate sulfate to neutralize the bleach. We check the temperature and pH of the PBR to avoid thermal or pH shocks. And after that, we perform the inoculation of the microalgae. Normally for the inoculation, the culture bags seen above are added directly to the PBR. However, sometimes we don't have enough concentration or amount of microalgae here in language. So our colleagues in Swansea bring us the culture directly from the university. This culture is about 400 liters, which serve us as inoculum to start with the culture in the PBR. Once the PBR is inoculated completely or partially, we add the dye state to 2.5% of the final volume. After the necessary days, which may vary depending on the season, and with enough microalgal concentration within the PBR, the culture is harvested again. Before that, Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jose Ignacio. I'm a research technician from Swansea University in charge of controlling the microalgal biomass production process, together with my colleague Vanessa, in the photobioreactor located here in Langage AD in the south of England. And today I will show you the process of inoculation and control that we make for the microalgae culture. To begin with, this is the PBR we use in the project. It has a capacity of 7,000 500 liters to 800 liters at its maximum volume. It consists of a dark tank and seven modules, which we can control and divide into one, three or seven modules that is considered full PBR, depending on the needs of the culture. We also have a heating cooling system coupled with the tank in order to control the temperature of the culture. 
Finally, the PBR has artificial light installed in the modules, which is used to increase the hours of light at times of the year when there is less sunlight such as winter. The final thing I will say about the PBR is that we have used the microalgae Chlorella vulgaris and Senedesmus obliquus. To start with the inoculation process, we must first scale up the microalgae in the laboratory, starting from 100 ml to 1 liter which we adapt to increasing concentration of dye state from 0.5% to 2.5%. Once adapted in the laboratory, we proceed to the inoculation of 25 liters carboy, located in the greenhouse. These carboys will be used to inoculate 80 liter bags when the density is enough for scaling up. Finally, when we have the enough numbers of bags with the right density and liters of culture, we can start with the culture growing in the PBR. But before the PBR inoculation with the culture, we must first take a series of steps to avoid any kind of contamination. 24 hours before the inoculation, we use the membrane to filter the water that is added to the PBR. We add bleach to the water filtered in the PBR and we leave it running for 24 hours. The next day, we add thiosulfate sulfate to neutralize the bleach. We check the temperature and pH of the PBR to avoid thermal or pH shocks and, after that, we perform the inoculation of the microalgae. Normally for the inoculation, the culture bags seen above are added directly to the PBR. However, sometimes we don't have enough concentration or amount of microalgae here in language. So our colleagues in Swansea bring us the culture directly from the university. This culture is about 400 liters, which serve us as an inoculum to start with the culture in the PBR. Once the PBR is inoculated completely or partially, we add the dye state to 2.5% of the final volume. After the necessary days, which may vary depending on the season, and with enough microalgal concentration within the PBR, the culture is harvested again. Before that, the water that will be replaced with the culture that we extract from the PBR must be filtered to equal the levels. Normally, we make a harvest of about 2000 liters, which is passed through the membrane to concentrate the density up to about 6 to 7 grams per liter in the case of Senedesmus and 2 to 3 grams per liter in the case of Chlorella. When we obtain these concentrations, we proceed to inoculate the mixotrophic model. The model consists of tubes that are constantly aerated to maintain a high agitation level. Also, there is an artificial light that is on 24 hours. We add the concentrated culture into this model, then 10 grams per liter of the selected carbon source which can be glucose, dextrose, or chewing gum powder. The microalgae are only kept in the mixotrophic module for 72 hours. We obtain around 14 grams per liter of Senedesmus and around 6 grams per liter of chlorella. Finally, after 72 hours, the culture is passed through the centrifuge to obtain the microalgal paste, which is stored in the freezer, and then processed according to the final destination. We also make daily routine controls, taking a sample from the PBR, and although the control process of the PBR is automatic, <coughs> we check and record the data of pH, dissolved oxygen and temperature. We also record external parameters such as sunlight, environmental temperature, humidity and weight, although the last ones are less useful for the process. To complete the analysis, we check daily factors like the amount of ammonium and phosphate absorbance and dry weight. We also check under the microscope looking for any kind of contamination. That's all. I hope I have explained it clearly how the process works. However, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the organizer Alasil Kid. Hello everyone and welcome to the Algae D parallel session. I hope everyone make their way here and sorry about uh, these technical problems at the beginning, but I hope it will run smoothly right now. And uh, I would like to introduce you first speaker in our session is Professor Carol Loellen. Professor Carol Loellen from Swansea University, Department of Bioscience, provide overall scientific leadership on Algae D project. She has several decades of experience working on algae. She has led many national and uh, European and international projects, working with industry to apply the many beneficial properties of algae. Carol work as, uh, has an overall theme relating to how algae can be used to help uh, tackle society big challenges. 
And these challenges relate to climate change, human health, bioenergy, food security, aquaculture, wastewater, and pollution by remediation, and also industrial biotechnology and circular economy, bioeconomy. So Carol, uh, please, um, can you start your presentation? It's my great pleasure to introduce you to the ALGAD project. This project is about creating value from waste nutrients. It's about integrating algal technology. So we can see here on the left, algae growing in photobioreactors and combining that with industrial anaerobic digestion technology. So my name is Carol Llewellyn and I'm a professor in Applied Aquatic Biosciences and I'm from Swansea University and I am, um, will be the first of three talks in which we'll be talking about this project. So my presentation will be to reflect and give an overview of the project primarily focused on the achievements and the potential of the project. So a little bit of background about the project. So the project has been running since 2017, so nearly four years now, and it was funded to a value of 6.2 million euros, 3.7 million euros um, contributed by Interreg um, Northwest Europe, with the remaining from various partners and in industrial partners. The partners, 11 partners, consisted of um, from the UK, France, Belgium, and Germany. So the UK partners led by Swansea University um, also involved were Langage AD as the industrial facility where one of our pilots was based and another partner from, uh, from the UK was Birmingham City University and Lindsay Melville will be talking about the decision support tours that they were involved in where they brought together all of the data and the findings into a suite of tours. The French partners involved were CNRS, UBO, University of um, uh, Brittany, Cooperl as our industrial partners as pig, pig feed manufacturers and producers of pig, pig products, AC3A and Anasis. And then from Belgium, our partners were the University of Ghent, working alongside the industrial partner in a lab who are experts at understanding um, digestate. And then KIT from Germany were involved with Birmingham City University on the life cycle analysis. And alongside the main partners, there were a number of associate partners who helped us advise and produce a number of reports. So the project was very much a collaborative um, teamwork where all of the partners had expertise and combined this expertise together to work towards the goals of the project. And we really couldn't have done it without everybody working together in a very cohesive fashion. So um, I think this was just, just something that was brilliant about the project. We all worked very well together as a team. So in summary, the project was a circular economy project and involved taking um, waste food, which was digested in an anaerobic digestion facility, as you can see as exampled here. Um, and the anaerobic digestion facility produces a biogas, which is produced in this big tank here, which can be used as an energy source, but it also produces a digestate. Most digestate can be returned to land but some of it is produced in excess. And because of legislation, we can't put it to land. So it's this digestate that we were interested in using. And we grew the algae on this excess digestate. So we built facilities next to AD plants using the excess digestate. We then produced biomass and pr processed it to produce um, feed formulations, which were then used in piglet feed trials. More recently, we've also undertaken some aquaculture trials using fish. 
So Work Package 1 set up three pilot or investment facilities in three different countries. We operated these investments and we used the waste nutrients from the AD to produce algal biomass. Work Package 2 characterised this biomass and developed the biomass into commercial products. And this mainly involved doing the piglet feed trials and latterly the fish feed trials. We called this a capitalization work package because it was added on as an additional work package. Work package three and four involved the scenario and decision support tools, which you will be hearing about, and long term rollout of the technology working with interested stakeholders, including farmers and um, AD plants. The project wouldn't have been as successful as it was without a good project management team. So great project management and communications enabled us to bring all of these work packages together and to work to deliver on the milestones and the deliverables of the project. So the three investment facilities or pilot facilities, one based in Devon in the UK, and you can see here a picture of the Langage facility and our um, facility, the algal facility that we built in a greenhouse that sat alongside this facility. In France, the facility was based at the industrial site in Couperle in Lambelle. And again, they have an, an AD um, plan on, on the big um, Cooper Old site and a new, a new algal facility was set up there. Likewise, in Belgium at the Inner Lab, um, the Belgian partners, because they had less experience to begin with in cultivating algae on a large scale, used a similar design to the one that we had in the UK. But all three partners used different types of digestate to test the digestate and different types of algae. In the UK, we used chlorella and senodesmus, and we grew it in an autotrophic mode that is using sunlight and natural light and in a mixotrophic mode so that is using an additional source of carbon. In Couperl they actually used a, what we call a heterotrophic species, a chytrid, and they grew it in it on a, car, a carbon source so taking a slightly different approach and then again um, in the Belgium facility they used um, what we call a consortia they used a mix of different types of algae they used chlorella and desmodesmus and again in the autotrophic mode so those were our three facilities and you'll hear more about the algal cultivation in the next talk by Dr Arla Silkina so here's a quick summary of, um, the, of the process that we used in the UK. So we grew the algae in the photobioreactor. We then concentrated up the biomass, so to get rid of the majority of water using membrane concentration. And then we grew the algae in a mixotrophic mode. This was to increase the amount of biomass. So if you give the algae carbon, they produce higher amounts of biomass. So then we used this bulk biomass up to process it to produce feeds that um, were then used in the piglet feed trials and also then to, to fill the, the circular economy circle, any waste from that can go back into the algal, the anaerobic digestion plant. So the facilities and the use of these pilot facilities or investments was backed up by extensive laboratory experiments, both to optimize the digestate and the algal cultivation. And again, you will hear a little bit more about this in the, in the next talk. But digestate, as you can see here in these measuring cylinders, is is quite dark in color. And so it had to be diluted and processed before we could um, we could feed it to the algae and you can see here in these little cubettes um, how the we, we, we processed the, the digestate to make it suitable for, for growth. And then we undertook a range of different culturing experiments. Some of the results are presented here. These are just really top level um, examples. Of, in the top left hand side, some of the digestate studies we did where we membrane filtered the digestate using different concentrations, um, micro filtered at 2.5% and nano filtered ranging up to 15 percent dilution of the digestate. We also undertook longer 
term photobioreactor PBR studies to see how much biomass we could produce over, over a period of up to a year. We then characterized that biomass for proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. And we found actually that in using the digestate, we were able to um, the biomass contained a higher amount of protein than it did if it was just grown on standard media. So this was an, an interesting finding, actually, and is a real benefit of growing the algae on the digestate. We were also interested to see how the composition of the algal biomass changed over different seasons. And here we can see a plot of the total fatty acids, TFAs, so basically the oil content of the algae over different periods. We also did many studies on um, processing the biomass to break down some of the proteins into more valuable um, peptides. So did a characterize, did a, a series of different hydrolyzation studies. These photos show some of the biomass that we produced and that's just part, um, putting it into a container to ship off to France before it was processed further for the, for the pig feed trial. So some of the members of the, the UK team here all masked up working to COVID principles. So much of our work is, has been published and is in the process of being published. So please do refer to some of the papers that are coming out of the work that we've been doing. Like I said, all of this data was then brought together um, to develop the scenario planning and decision support tools. And uh, Professor Lindsay Melville from BCU will be um, introducing these decision support tools to basically identify um, different sites that can be used. So opportunities of, of um, finding different sites that produce waste, um, where they might be opt where we could optimally cultivate algae and then optimizing process design, assessing the commercial viability of the technology and also the environmental impact of the technology. So like I say, this will be introduced in the third talk in this session. We produced a range of different best practice documents and documents on regulation and policy. Um, the second two documents on the regulation and policy were um, produced with our partner NFCC. So please, these are all available on our website. So if you want to find out more, of course, um, request a copy. One of our main, um, well not main, but one of our um, communication outputs was to have this exhibition, an ARG ad exhibition at the Durvel Experimental Farm in France. And there are <clears throat> many webinars associated with this exhibition. Of course, most of it has, has to have been done via Zoom and online because of COVID, but there are many great webinars that you, um, I should really watch to find out more about the project. So basically, we've managed to deliver on um, all of these aims and um, milestones and deliverables of the project. We're still involved in bringing together all of the data and the decision and support tools and in the long term rollout of the technology. And I really we really want to work with a range of new stakeholders in terms of farmers and AD people that are interested in working with us on the technology. So a summary of our key achievements. Well, we've really been able to demonstrate the circular approach to using the circular economy in agriculture. And our project has shown that microalgae can be used within the circular economy, converting waste nutrients into new products. The project has been excellent in bringing together farmers, the AD industry and algal researchers together to work as teams to actually innovate and develop this new technology. We've been successful at demonstrating this technology at this pilot scale. And we found that we've proven that Digeste actually produces a free source of nutrients to cultivate algae, which is great news. We don't have to buy the media to cultivate algae. And actually the algae grow very well on the waste nutrients. And actually, as I mentioned, algae grown on the Digeste are richer in protein. So basically then this unwanted resource, this Digeste that's not required, 
and can be a pollutant problem can be used in successfully in animal feed. However, with all projects, there are always some challenges. My highlight here is some of the challenges that I see. Well, scaling. So digestate is produced in enormous quantities across Europe and is increasingly being produced as more people use anaerobic digestion technology. But we found we had to di dilute the digestate quite considerably to about 5%, typically 2.5%. We really need to work on further on using a less diluted form of digestate because if we dilute the digestate, then we can't use as much of it. And we really need to be using this a significantly greater amount of digestate for it to make a real economic e impact. Nevertheless, the digestate is a free source of nutrients. Legislation and regulation is also an issue where you're using waste streams to produce an animal feed. And these are very nicely covered. These issues are very nicely covered in the reports that have been produced. We really feel also that the challenge is to get as much value out of the algae biomass that's been produced as, pro as possible. So although we've developed uh, animal feeds and are developing animal feeds, the real value comes from higher value products. So near term potential, rather than using um, anaerobic digestion waste where animal, animal waste has been digested, then it makes much better to sense to focus on vegetable or plant based AD industries and ideally a single source. So it could be, for example, um, a crisper making factory where they have potato waste, so potato skins or just a single source of, of plant material would be the, the easiest way to develop this technology. There's also potential for combining with CO2 bioremediation, but the same goes as for using nutrients. It's better suited for small to medium scale CO2 emitters, so not big um, producers of CO2, not big industry. Um, and like I say, we really need to focus on producing the biomass to produce higher value products. We've been working on and have published a review on using algae as biostimulants, as fertilizers. So that is an example of another great use of the algal biomass. So there's huge potential in this technology as, the, as we're encouraged globally to move towards more sustainable agriculture and reduce pollution, algae really can provide a great answer to many issues. Um, NVZs, the nutrient vulnerable zones, are expanding across Europe. And so we really need technologies that use algae to provide a solution. So again, on sustainable agriculture, new sources of protein and new biofertilizers are needed. And again, algae provide an answer with, from, from that. And there's also algae has much potential in producing other high value products. So we really want to work with stakeholder community, individual farmers or AD plants um, would be great collaborators. And the work that we're doing fits to many um, existing funding calls from national, European and international bodies. And I think as well as developing into more um, individual projects, I think there's real potential in developing an old ad network within Europe so that we can all share best practice and take this technology forward. So finally, um, really to move this technology and the science forward, we welcome collaboration and feedback. And most of all, in this talk, I want to give a big thank you to everyone that has been involved in this project, all the people that have made it such a success, who've been willing to overcome challenges and to put in a huge amount of effort to make this a great, fun project to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carol, for this nice presentation. I have time for really one question right now, but I just would like to remind you then we will have a question and answer session by the end of um, all presentation, then you can be able also to put your camera on and, uh, you know, just have a discussion with all speakers. So Floris was asking, a major problem is indeed the variability of the content of the algae. So either you have to grow in constant condition, 
uh, not in a greenhouse, or you have to be able to still sell the products while it's different. Any specific ideas, project regarding to how to cope with this? Do company agree with changing composition, or is they ever addressing during certain study, are there any legal regulation on this? Carol, so can you please reply right now? Okay, so I'm just replying to this one question at the moment. We'll yes, pick up the yeah. other questions later on and I can talk through them rather than replying to them in the message. Yes. So actually, I don't think that the um, seasonal variation in the composition of the algae is too, is too much. So when we're growing them in, in PBRs, we have the real advantage that we can control what we're growing. And that really is the big advantage on controlling algae in enclosed systems rather than in open pond or in raceway systems. Like I mentioned, we've been growing chlorella and senodesmus and we've been characterizing that quite carefully. So of course there's some variation in the composition of the, the protein and carbohydrate, but we know the limits of that variation. And I think as long as industry is accepting and would be accepting of those variations, then that is absolutely fine. It's the same as growing any crop, actually. Um, you know, the, the crops change the composition according to the nutrient conditions, for example, that they're grown in. And we eat these, these crops that have variation in nutrients. So it's exactly the same with algae. Algae are just really another um, agricultural crop that happen to grow in an aqueous system. So um, I don't think it's it's too much of a problem. Um, I, I think probably that's, I mean, I can, I can discuss this in more detail because indeed, if you're looking for particular niche compounds, then it it might be slightly different and you might need to control the conditions even more but if you're producing it for bulk food then it really isn't an issue thank you very much carol thank you right um thank you uh next speakers will be me <laughs> so let me introduce myself right now so um i am a senior postdoc postdoctoral researcher within the algae biotechnology group in swans university and I'm also in charge, I'm research officer for the Algae AD project and also in charge of communication activities within this project. And my role uh, for Algae AD was the main point of contact for the partners exchange for the activities of work package one and work package three. And my contribution, main contribution to the work package one, um, I was written, uh, wrote in the document best practice guidelines on the optimal nutrient removal and algal uptake. So this is what I will be uh, talking in my presentation right now to you. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Alice Silkina, I'm from Swans University, and today I would like to present you uh, results and outcomes from the work package technical one of the Algae project. And my presentation title is Algal Cultivation, Optimizing Algal Biomass Production at Three Industrial Pilot Facilities Using Different Strain and Different Type of Digestate. Um, as Carl Llewellyn said uh, about overview of the Algae AD project. This project is focused on circle bioeconomy. And uh, the main uh, objective of this work package is uh, convert excess of waste nutrients to create algal biomass for sustainable animal feeds, construct and operate three large scale pilot facilities of algal cultivation and industrial facilities of anaerobic digestion plants, produce enough algal biomass to be used in formulation animal and feed fish uh, feeding trials and provide information and all data collected from the trials to support the development of decision support tool for the stakeholder engagement. So the main approach as we use this in Swans University, we start from the lab scale to the pilot side. So first of all, uh, we use our, our flask laboratory scale analysis of the digest state and dilution of digest state with suitable growth of algae and species selection. So we start with chlorella, vulgaris, and uh, after that, we, we focus also on celidesmus. We scale up until 20 liters, and next step was, was 80 liters. And of this, uh, still at university, we try uh, chlorella, vulgaris, and 800 liters PBR in aim to uh, optimize this culture for the biomediation activities while the construction of PBR at Langage AD uh, was made. 
And there we just grow algae in uh, 7,000 liters PBR facilities. And there was two species, Corella vulgaris and Sandesmus. So three pilot facilities were constructed. First one, as I mentioned, is Langage AD at Plymouth in the United Kingdom. Second one was in facilities of Cooper and Lambal in France. And uh, in Belgium, it was in a lab of, uh, working uh, in collaboration with Ghent University. So each algal uh, plant were location, located in, in the algae AD, uh, in, in anaerobic digestion facilities, uh, in industrial location. So this is like bring some implication in, in the way but it's uh, lesson, lots of lesson learned for the future uh, technology exploitation. So uh, first approach, we did analyze the digest state because this is kind of a really thick, uh, really dark liquid. And when we add this to the algal cultivation unit, it's um, difficult to remediate because of the high nutrients concentration and also high level of turbidity. And it will be difficult to deal with this. So we did uh, some pre-treatment of digestate to make the process of algal cultivation easy in a way to uh, remove as much nutrients as we can. So uh, here in this table presented some um, pilot site and the method how we pre-treat the digestate. So in the case of lung gauge, it was membrane filtration using ultra -filtr filtration with the pore size of 100 kilodalton is in a lab at uh, the University of Ghent. It was paper filtered digestate and Cooper uh, use again membrane filtration, this ultra filtration uh, method of 300 kilodalton. So different type of uh, digestate origin we use. And here's a presented co composition and nutrient concentration, especially for nitrogen and phosphorus. So we can see then uh, some of reduction of uh, nutrients for nitrogen and phosphorus was made after pretreatment. And we also check element, elemental composition uh, for, the, uh, for the metals, essential metal for the algal cultivation process. But we also noticed then uh, only, not only nutrients, but also color was reducted, particles was removed, and of course, NMP concentration. We did also check on biological contaminants uh, in a way to check if this biomass, algal biomass, uh, further on uh, will be used for the animal feed production. And of course, composition of heavy metal as well for the uh, safety analysis uh, to be in precautious um, side to get this right for the future exploitation of the biomass. So um, we published paper for this. Uh, Ferian Fernandez, she's a researcher in Fulls University with collaboration of other researchers published this paper. So you, it's available online. So for the species selection, it also was different species selected for the each site. In Langage AD, we use Clarella vulgaris and Sandesmus obliquus. For the Cooper, we use uh, trusted kit treats um, uh, species. And for the inner lab, it was originally a mixed consortium, naturally, um, naturally uh, taken from the site uh, with mixture of Corella and Desmodesmus. So for the results of Langage AD, you can see we get uh, uh, quite good results growing Chlorella species on autotrophic compared with mixotrophic growth as well uh, in, in this way. So this is like autotrophic growth, but we, when we are start to grow on mixotrophic, we reach up to six grams per liter. This is the long run, so the longest run we have. And here you can see Green dots is uh, presented uh, cultivation uh, growth data of chlorella, and the brown dot is for the semidesmos. And we also, uh, as uh, we combine two methods, autotrophic cultivation and mixotrophic cultivation, we also test on different substrate of uh, sugar to use for chlorella and semidesmos. And uh, also we check if uh, in under mixotrophic condition. Algae still consume uh, ammonium as a nutrient source from the waste for the waste remediation purposes. And we get these good results of waste remediation and at the same time uh, growth on mixotrophic condition. And there is doubling uh, our, even tripling our biomass in really short period of time. So results of these experiments was uh, put in a paper as well, published by Claudio Fuentes Grunewald. And, uh, uh, colleagues 
And this paper also available online. And if you would like to get a copy, please contact me and I will be happy to share this with you. So in Cooperel Lambal, uh, completely different species, it was heterotrophic cultivation. So we, this species of algae really rich in PUFA and we, the main objective was to check if this species could, could grow on uh, anaerobic digestion waste and how to make the production of these valuable compounds is really sustainable. So um, different type of reactor, different um, way of cultivating. This algae doesn't need light. The red light was added in, in terms of like if it's the system could be used for growth of corella. But here results presented for the trastechytrids and we can see then is um, quite good growth. This species grow very fast in hours. So if uh, in previous case, we use days to cultivate the algae. So in this case, uh, the total biomass of eight gram per liter was reached within 40 hours and uh, good consumption of uh, ammonium also um, presented in these graphs. In inner lab, when we use mixage consortium, but when we do this uh, growth for the long term, we can see one species who is leading the growth. And in these cases was this modestness cultivation in these top graphs. And we can see dry weight. So in this case, in different trials, maximum concentration could be reached. It was about 2.5 grams per liter. And um, quite good uh, uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus presented in, in this graph. So if we summarize, so for three pilot facilities in Langage HD, Cupro and Lambal and Inolab Ghent, we use 2.5% of digestate. So this dilution is quite um, uh, optimized for the for successful growth of the biomass. But of course, 2.5% is present different uh, concentration of nitrogen, specifically for the ammonium, and was 80 milligrams per liter for Langage. 70 milligrams per liter for Cooper and 50 milligrams per liter for Inola. So time of cultivation for each run, it was seven days for cultivation in lung gauge and Inola is the same because we use autotrophic cultivation and two, two days of cultivation for uh, Cooper facilities. So in mix of phase in lung gauge, we add 10 grams per liter of glucose uh, to maximize the biomass concentration and in Cupro, we use also um, additional of uh, nutrients completed to the digestate. It was 20 grams per liter for glucose, two grams per liter of yeast extract, and two grams per liter of peptone. No external nutrients were added for the inner lab uh, cultivation system. So in the final uh, results, we have 14 grams per liter final biomass for land gauge facilities, four grams per liter for Cupro, but for the period of time what we use this cultivation system was really good results and 1.7 grams per liter final biomass for Inulab. For the nitrogen uptake, uptake, it was 20 milligrams per liter per day for land gauge facilities, 35 milligrams per liter per day for Cupro, and 20 milligrams per liter per, per day for uh, Inulab. So here's the summarizing, uh, some uh, extrapolation of these results to, to get you um, some uh, numbers if we can uh, reach this concentration for year. For example, in Lange AGD, we use two species, it was Chlorella and Senedesmos. And in case of Senedesmos, we could produce 4, gram, uh, 4, 4 kilograms per batch. And if we extrapolate this per year, it will be 186 kilograms per year. For Chlorella, it's a bit less, it's 2.2 uh, kilograms per batch and 97 kilograms per year. For the nitrogen removal uh, per year, it could be uh, 10.9 kilograms. And in totals, uh, when we use this um, nutrient-rich digestate, NRD, it could be used 2.5 tons per year. And the raw digestate, it's, this is filtered digestate, but raw digestate when you use before filtering system, it will be five uh, tons. For the inner lab in this existing facilities, what we use, so we production per batch was 4.3 kilograms, and per year extrapolation is will be um, 47 kilograms per year. For the nitrogen removal, uh, really similar data to the uh, land gauge HD facilities. So it will be 10 kilograms of um, nitrogen per year. And in total, we can use nutrient rich digestate is 3.5 tons, and raw digestate 4.5. 
For the corporal facilities, the working volume of the uh, PBR was 1.3 um, thousand liters. Production per batch was five kilograms. And uh, per year, extrapolation could be given for 250 kilograms because this biomass can be grown very fast. For the nitrogen removal, it will be uh, 3.1 kilograms per year and raw digestate use uh, 1.9 tons. So um, additionally to this, uh, work package one activities was focused as well on the harvesting of the biomass from the PBR. We used two methods in lung gauge AD facilities. This was microfiltration, same system what we use for the pretreatment of the digestate. What is like given this process uh, will be good for the circular bioeconomy. And after that, to future step for the water in the biomass, it was continuous flow centrifuge. In corporal facilities, we use this uh, also microfiltration step, this um, uh, filtration system from Siva TM using a uh, 300 kilodalton ceramic membrane. And also, um, uh, in a lab, I uh, use centrifugation for this. Around 20 kilograms of dry algal biomass was produced and provided from each side for the feed formulation and hydrolyzation step trials. So after algal biomass harvesting, uh, we compare nutrient composition to the control condition and we finalize this. Then the uh, biomass grown and digestate has high concentration on protein pigments and fatty acid, uh, up to 70% of protein content. And also next step was hydrolyzation for the function of protein fractionation and use this uh, hydrolyzed biomass for the animal feed development, a testing for pigs and for fish. But this is like data will be coming soon for, for this. So uh, for the results of this um, activities of work package one, we produced two best practice documents. They are available on our website. If you're interested, also please contact me or go on our website, AlgaeD Internet Project. You can get, uh, you, you can download these uh, two best practice uh, documents. One is focused on guidelines for the cultivation of microalgae and nutrient rich digestate. And second one is guidelines for cultivation of microalgae. Um, so the, one is the pretreatment of digestate, another uh, microalgae cultivation. So uh, please follow, follow our algae AD project on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And if you have any question, I will be really happy to answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so all questions uh, coming uh, for this talk, please put in the chat box. I can see um, uh, partners of Algae D project already quite actively answer this. So no one question will be without answer, but we will, a uh, matter of time, we'll move um, all remaining question to the question and answer session. And also I would like to remind you then we'll be later on a breakout discussion group, then we can have um, more productive discussion on specific topic. And now it's my pleasure to present you uh, Philippe Sudan, uh, um, Dr. Philippe Sudan, a PhD from Marine Biology and Biochemistry, Director of Research at the National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, from France. And his research is on study of the lip lipid composition of marine organisms, as well as the study of physiological mechanism regulating lipid synthesis, dietary acquisition and allocation. And he's interested in various marine organisms like microalgae and bivirals. Philippe um, was leader of the work package two, uh, talking about developing algal biomass into commercial products. So Philippe, the floor is yours. Hello, I'm Philippe Soudan. I'm a researcher at CNRS and I'm the uh, scientific leader of the CNRS part partnership. Before I start, I would like to thank the Interreg Northwest Europe for funding the Algae project. The aim of this presentation is to give you some uh, general information on the downstream processing used from cultivated macroalgae biomass to the production of ingredients for animal feed and aquaculture. First of all, I'm going to give you a few background information on that uh, Algae project. The project started with the observation that Increasing quantities of organic waste are being treated by anaerobic digestion in Northwest Europe. This process converts uh, organic waste into biogas to produce energy. However, it has the disadvantage of producing a liquid effluent rich in nitrogen 
called digestate. And currently, this digestate is mainly used as a soil fertilizer. Like other uh, soil fertilizer, its application in excess uh, affects or harm aquatic environment. Using this uh, excess uh, nutrient to produce macroalgae could limit the environmental impact of such nitrogen-rich waste and also producing innovative ingredients for animal feed and aqua feed. The whole project is part of a circular economy approach summarized in that figures. The Algae project therefore focuses on the frame part and has been structured in three major tasks that interacts with each other to meet socioeconomic and environmental challenge. The first task was to produce uh, macroalgae biomass from nutrient-rich digestate. The second task was to develop environment-friendly processes transforming macroalgae biomass into feed and carrying out animal trials on piglets and fish. The third task was to carry out uh, market analysis and developing decision support tools to assess the socio-economic feasibility and environmental impact of the process implemented from cultivation to feed production. The downstream processing part has been divided in three activities. The first activity includes quality monitoring, harvesting, and storage of the biomass. The second one includes the fractionation and biochemical characterization of the biomass. The third one uh, includes feed formulation, zootechnical trials, and market analysis. Although the market analysis is listed at last, it was a concern from the beginning of the project. Considering low margin animal feed on aquafeed sectors, we knew that given the cost of the producing of producing macroalgae biomass and the downstream processing involved, it was essential that the final ingredient provide a real nutritional benefit. Before starting downstream processing, it is very important to assess the quality of the biomass, biomass we're going to use according to cultivated species and culture condition. Using microscopy or flow cytometry, it is possible to monitor the health of the microalgae on a regular basis, possibly several times a day. When the culture is in good health, uh, we can move on, move on and look at the biochemical quality of the biomass and draw up a biochemical profile of this biomass. This gives us information to evaluate the possible cultivation drift or seasonal variation of this biomass. It also uh, allows us to assess the production yield of the targeted ingredients. The biomass uh, harvesting, which aim to eliminate as much as possible the water, is a key step because it partly determines the downstream processing that we can apply. We are not specialists at all of in all the harvesting testing with, uh, that are available on the market, but there's many parameters to take into account. We can mention, for example, the resistance or fragility of the, of the cells, the initial concentration, the final concentration of the, of the culture uh, we, we, we are targeting, uh, the form in which it is stored and the storage capacity available. Uh, so our approach at, at this stage of the project was mainly empirical. For the three pilots, there was first uh, a filtration step, which allowed the biomass to be concentrated by a factor of 10 to 25. For the autotrophic microalgae with a low initial concentration, the, the filtration step brings the biomass to about 2% solid matter, and it is completed by a centrifugation step to arrive at an algal pace with 20% solid matter. For the heterotrophic uh, macroalgae with a higher initial concentration, the collection process by filtration stop at about 10% solid matter. And but it can also be uh, further improved by centrifugation, but we haven't done it in that project. The storage step may seem uh, trivial uh, and easy, but it can be quickly uh, become a headache. In the algae uh, project, um, 
Agade project, uh, we chose to store the biomass at minus 20 because uh, we had to store it for several months before starting the next steps in the joint stream processing. Uh, but that posed several uh, problems or questions. First, you need quite some space for the storage. Uh, for example, in the case of the French pilot, we had to store about 600 liters of the concentrated biomass at 100 grams per liter. And uh, second, we, we don't know much about the stability of this biomass at minus 20. So we cannot exclude the degradation or oxi oxidative pro process. And finally, a transportation of the frozen biomass to the place of its downstream processing must be carefully uh, managed. This test can be costly and risky if the cold chain is not uh, maintained. Another solution uh, is to dry the biomass, uh, either by spray drying or freeze drying. He has a double advantage of reducing both the volume to be stored and the risk of degradation due to the presence of water. Uh, freeze drying is the most expensive uh, process, uh, but it gives very stable uh, biomass, dry biomass. And while the spray drying requires more expertise, and often the addition of antioxidant compounds. Since this process of freeze dry or spray drying exposes the biomass to a relatively high temperature. Fractionation step make possible to extract uh, ingredients of nutritional interest for animal feed or aquafeed. Uh, the process implemented depends on what we are trying to value, for example, omega-3 or peptide in our project. It also depends on the species of microalgae considered and the cultivation condition. At last, it also depends on environmental consider considerations such as carbon footprint, water consumption, uh, use of chemicals, so on and so forth. Within the Algade project, uh, we have chosen to carry out uh, enzymatic hydrolysis to extract our compounds of interest, omega-3 PUFA and peptides. This uh, approach allows us to have an environmental friendly approach for lipid extraction, avoiding the use of organic solvent. And in the meantime, it allows the production of peptide with potential antimicrobial, immunostimulant or antioxidant activity. Enzymatic hydrolysis was then performed on concentrated biomass. We developed and optimized the enzymatic hydrolysis process first at the laboratory scale by changing temperature, pH, enzyme, quantity of enzyme, so on and so forth. And once the process was optimized at lab scale, we performed biochemical characterization of the resulting ingredient. And then finally, we moved to the pilot scale on 300 uh, liters of uh, concentrated biomass. The um, hydrolyzed biomass was then freeze dry, uh, spray dry uh, with addition of the antioxidant to limit the degradation of the ingredient, particularly the omega-3 PUFA. The animal trial were performed with piglets and fishes by including the hydrolyzed biomass or non-hydrolyzed biomass in their feed. For the trial on piglets, um, we had two objectives with that macroalgae hydrolysate. First, we wanted the appetizing ingredient that stimulate the animal feeding and avoiding uh, weight loss. And second, a peptide rich ingredient that, according to the literature, could reduce uh, uh, digestive inflammation caused by oxidative stress. Two experiments were performed to study the dose effect of the ingredient derived from Orantochytrium and derived from Senedesmus, both at 1, 2, and 3% of dry matter. The data of these two experiments are currently analyzed. The measure parameters are weight gain, fecal score, feed efficiency, diarrhea score, aptoglobin, biological antioxidant potential, and dichrome reactive oxygen metabolite. Similarly, we perform nutrition fish trial with both orontiochytrium and senendesmus biomasses. 
Orantio Kitria mangrovi non hydrolyzed biomass was included at 15% of a standard feed to, for Sibas juvenile and larvae. Additionally, we use hydrolyzed biomass uh, to, be, to test it on larvae at 15% as well. Overall, uh, inclusion of 15% of microalgae biomass allowed a good growth uh, from 30 grams to 50 grams in six weeks for Sibas uh, juveniles, which, is, which was uh, equivalent or actually equal to control feed. Interestingly, uh, a slightly better growth was obtained for Sibas larvae when compared to control feed after 40 days of deuterary uh, conditioning. However, feed with hydrolyzed biomass uh, was equivalent to uh, feed uh, to control feed of the larvae. So, uh, neutral, neutral fish trial were also conducted with uh, Senedesmus obliquus hydrolyzed biomass, which was included at 10% of the standard feed for tilapia juveniles. After a month, <coughs> Inclusion of 10% of macroalgae hydrolyzed biomass results in a similar survival rate as compared to control feed, but a growth rate slower than control feed. However, uh, fish fed hydrolyzed senedesmus biomass were as uh, healthy as those uh, fed the control diet. Transitory change in the microbiome of the fish fed hydrolyzed biomass may explain the observed uh, slower uh, growth. In Algare uh, project, we also investigate the microbial quality of the macroalgae biomass and as well as the, the digestate. As you know, digestate is uh, category two animal byproduct and is prohibited to be used as feed for farm animals. Nevertheless, no regulation exists on the safety criteria applicable to digestate used to grow algae. So we decide to control the presence of pathogen in both the digestate and the macroalgae biomass. The selection of the analyzed pathogen was based on the scientific literature that assess the effect of anaerobic digestion of the reduction of pathogen known to be present in manure. It includes two sporulating and five non sporulating pathogens commonly detected in manure. Results uh, from this study, uh, first in digestate after filtration. Uh, in both copel and Langet digestate were both uh, negative for non-sporating and sporating bacteria, while Inolab digestate was positive for both. It is likely because they, we, we use different filtration system uh, in the three uh, pilots. On the microbiomass, biomass, uh, it revealed that there were no uh, non-sporating bacteria for the three sites. For the sporating bacteria detection, uh, Crostidium botulinum when was negative for at Copel and Langage and weakly positive at Inolab. And Clostridium difficile was negative at Copel and weakly positive at Inolab and Langage. Even if this point is discussed at the end of the, this presentation, the target, uh, targeted market should be uh, taken in, into account from the beginning of the project. The market for macroalgae is growing rapidly despite high production costs. The most cultivated species are Spirulina, Chlorella, Dunalilla, Hematococcus, and Schizochytrium or similar. Most of the macroalgae cultivated on industrial scale are used in the food uh, compound market, but also in other markets such as nutraceutic, animal feed, dye, or medical markets. The most commonly extracted compounds or ingredients are carotenoids, FIPO below proteins, and omega-3 PUFA, uh, especially EPA and DHA. The self uh, between 10 and 1,000 euro per kilogram, depending on the product and its degree of refining. To date, there is a very little uh, information on the market for peptide produced for macroalgae. For this peptides, uh, it, it will depend on the nutritional benefits 
and that can be established for this type of product. Thank you for your attention and thank you to all uh, Algade uh, contributors to that uh, presentation. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so please, I can see active discussion in the chat box as well. If you have any question related to this presentation on other presentation, please put in the chat box. We'll have a short uh, question and answer session after all presenters will be done with their presentation. And also would like to remind you by uh, after that, we will have a specific discussion group. I can see lots of questions about legislation and safety analysis and so on. So we have um, people who did the analysis who work on this aspect will be um, available for you to discuss any other uh, questions. So a next speaker uh, is Professor Lindsay Melville. And uh, Professor Lindsay Melville is leading uh, the scenario planning to work package on Algae AD project. She's coming from Birmingham City University. And Lindsay works uh, on Algae AD, was focused on capture, collate, and integrate data, knowledge, and information from across the project into a range of online tools. These tools will be well uh, enable stakeholders and investors to explore the opportunity and challenges of the algae technology for algae AD. Uh, for the anaerobic digestion from the technical, economical, and process integration perspective. So, Lindsay, floor is yours. Hi, I'm Lindsay Melville from Birmingham City University, and I'm leading the development of scenario planning tools for the ALGAD project. The ALGAD project has a series of resources available to, for stakeholders. This includes a number of scenario planning tools in the form of reports, case studies and online support tools. These resources will help end users to explore the opportunities and challenges of algal biotechnologies for nutrient uptake and for animal feed production. The tools will help our stakeholders to identify potential opportunity sites via a map based application, assess commercial viability of technologies via our techno economic assessment, optimise future process designs, operation and performance using our process pathway tools, and also assess the environmental impacts and longer term sustainability of the process using our life cycle assessment case studies. This tool allows us to selectively identify sites which offer the greatest opportunity for the implementation of algal cultivation. Using existing data sets, we have mapped the location of existing AD plants across a number of regions in the UK, France, Belgium and Germany. For this project, we are most interested in those within nitrate vulnerable zones to assess the potential of this technology to reduce eutrophication in these zones. We also want to identify AD plants with predominantly use plant based feedstocks, as these are more suited to algal cultivation for animal feed. We also need to consider scale of the AD facilities so we can explore the scale of digestate supply within a region and to ensure the PBR process is commercially viable. We would also like to explore how we can use this data to, to inform decisions about the location of algal cultivation plants and enable better integration of the supply chains in the future. In order to evaluate commercial viability, the team has collected data from each of the pilot plants. This data includes the cost of construction, the materials, equipment and labour, the operation in terms of energy, water and other resources, and the overall rate of return on the pilot plants. The key findings, as well as the techno-economic assessment, is being integrated into an online tool, which will enable stakeholders to explore commercial viability of a project based on their own unique conditions and circumstances, and also assess the risks and sensitivities which will influence the economics over time for example, changing incentives or market fluctuations. A report on the macroeconomics of the process is also being completed, which will consider the market opportunities and challenges. So to give some example, Langage is our UK based AD plant and pilot plant. We have been collecting data on Langage pilot for approximately two years, and this data has been fed into our techno-economic assessment and our life cycle assessment. Some of the key findings from this assessment are that we know that in terms of total income from the AD plant, 75% of the total income currently comes from the sale of electricity to grid. 
There is an additional income stream from gate fees, which makes up around 20% of the total income, and a small percentage from heat used within the plant. The income for, from fertiliser sales represents around 2% of the total income. Some of our key findings are that the sale of the biofertiliser is an important revenue stream for Langage Farm. The biofertiliser is also used on the farm for soil enhancement. The project demonstrate that 2% of the digestate could be diverted to the photobioreactor to cultivate microalgae, increasing to potentially 10% with optimised operation. So for bioremediation perspective, this is a small percentage. Therefore, the value of the algal biomass is a really important economic driver. The assessment also explored the various market routes, utilising the whole algal biomass as feed or extracting high value ingredients from the feed. It was found that the whole cell biomass couldn't really compete with existing animal feeds such as soya meal currently, but there was a good opportunity to extract high value products. Two economic scenarios were also explored. The construction of the AD and the photobioreactor together and the construction of the photobioreactor as a retrofit to an existing AD plant. Obviously, retrofit is more cost effective, assuming that there is sufficient space and infrastructure for the photobioreactor facility. As part of the techno-economic assessment, we identified the hotspots with regard to high construction or operational costs. Some of the recommendations from the assessment were that the facility could be more economical if, for example, the tubular components were made of glass rather than plastic. This would have an increased cost initially, but would have longer life and require less cleaning and maintenance. Cost could also be reduced by recirculating the process water within the system rather than using potable water for dilution. Also, using excess electricity and heat from the AD would be beneficial. The life cycle assessment explored the environmental impact of the technology and process. Life cycle assessment is used to assess environmental impacts at all stages of the product's life. It enables us to identify issues in design and configuration and also opportunities to improve the long term sustainability of the process. Algad systems are split into three distinct subsystems that contain individual processes. The design of the life cycle assessment is flexible so that it can be adapted as the project progresses or as the process is optimised. As an example, this is the life cycle assessment system boundary for our pilot plant at Langage Farm. We have three subsystems currently, the AD plant, the membrane filtration process to pretreat the digestate, and the inoculation, photobioreactor and harvesting of the algal biomass. A fourth system is also being developed around the downstream processing of the algal biomass to convert it to animal feed. Once you've, designed, uh, once you've defined the system boundaries, you can capture the inputs and outputs of the process. So we've collected data on materials and resources. So for example, energy, water and chemicals, and also emissions to air, water and soil. For the purpose of this analysis, the functional unit is one metric tonne of algal animal feed. These are the impact categories used in the life cycle assessment. These are standard for life cycle assessment include, for example, impacts resulting from the use of resources, from the use of land, and from emissions to freshwater sources or to the atmosphere. And this is the output from the life cycle assessment for our pilot plant at Langage. The y-axis represents the total environmental impact of the process as 100%. The x-axis represents the different types of environmental impact categories. So for example, eutrophication or land use. The coloured bars represent the percentage of total impact for each of the parts of the process. So, for example, the orange bars represent the AD process. The royal blue bars is the photoautotrophic phase of the photobioreactor. This provides a visual representation of which parts of the overall process has the biggest environmental impacts across a number of different impact categories. What we found from this analysis was that the phototrophic phase, the photobioreactor, has the largest impact across most of the categories. This is primarily due to the photobioreactor construction and the energy and water consumption during operation. For land gauge, we found that the mixotrophic phase had the largest impact with regards to marine eutrophication and ozone depletion. 
This is due to the carbon source that is used to supplement the process. As part of the LCA, we conduct a sensitivity analysis to explore various scenarios for improving the overall sustainability of the process. This showed that, for example, using LEDs rather than fluorescent lights for the photobioreactor had less impact on the environment. And as with the techno-economic assessment, utilising excess heat and energy from the AD and reusing water within the process improved overall sustainability. The project has evolved a number of outputs and case studies based on the three pilot plants. So we have a number of databases, reports and case studies that will now be available on our website and via the decision support tool interface. We have also extracted and summarised all of the key findings from the TEA, LCA and mass and energy balance. So all of the information about the design, the construction and operation of the process and all of the resources and infrastructure considerations. And these are integrated into a process pathway tool. This tool will take the user through a series of queries and will capture information most pertinent to them. For example, their motivation for developing a photobioreactor their site conditions, e.g. the scale and nature and, um, of the process, and it will use this information to provide tailored recommendations. The process pathway tool will enable end users to explore appropriate technology options and configurations, explore infrastructure requirements, explore potential outputs, so remediation efficiency, end products and markets, based on inputs, the digestate characteristics, and also identify additional relevant resources. So for example, standard operating procedures, regulatory documents, or research papers. We will demonstrate all of these prototypes of these tools in our workshops later today. Thank you for listening and I'll take any questions. Okay, um, thank you very much for Lindsay's presentation. So now we have 15 minutes for a question and answer session. So I would like to invite all speakers to uh, put on cameras on and microphone as well. And uh, some of the questions were already answered uh, in um, chat, but um, I may repeat some of them, then everyone can, can see them. So first uh, question is uh, for Carol. So Gabriel is asking, when we increase the digestate concentration, ah, no, sorry, Carol, you replied to this, found the yeah. algae growing on, um, so we found the algae grow well, digestate was diluted to 2.5%. So what's the reason was for it? So can you please just quickly? Yeah, so I did answer this, but I mean, it's a really good question. And there's something that we've done a lot of research on, particularly early on in the project. And then we ran out of time because we had to produce biomass. And it's something that we really hope to pick up on, because obviously we would really like to be growing the algae on a much higher concentration of digestate. And there's something we think in the digestate that is preventing us from doing that. So we're not quite sure exactly exactly what it is um, so it's a it's a really good question we would like to be using a higher concentration of digestate we should in theory be able to use a higher concentration of digestate and of course it very much depends on what the source of your digestate is to begin with in fact our language digestate contains quite it's quite heavy in in nitrogen so we have to dilute it to a certain extent anyway other forms of digestate will have a lower concentration of nitrogen in fact Arla knows a lot more about this the, than me but I don't know probably because we haven't got a lot of time, we should pick up on this in a later discussion. Yeah, we'll have again breakout uh, room session uh, for the specific question re uh, regarding cultivation, harvesting and safety analysis and so on. Um, so another question is uh, related to um, uh, Philip talk about uh, safety analysis. And I can see Alison who did the uh, safety analysis already reply on some of this, um, but can you just comment please on it? Uh, so um, can one actually sell the algae growing on digestate and it might be sustainable, but these legal limits are still uh, prevent to do this. Philip, can you comment on this please? Yeah, actually, yeah, I remember we had a lot of discussion about it with Carol and all the people of the group. So yeah, unless uh, yeah, you can correct me, Carol, but uh, up to now, there's no, uh, it's not possible to, uh, to sell or use uh, macroalgae biomass uh, grown on digestate. Just 
like say the alasan, uh, just because uh, the digestate is category two animal byproduct, though, then it's uh, for whatever you do with it, uh, it cannot be uh, included in feed or, or, or food. Yes, yeah, so of course, if you're using digestate that is just produced from plant waste, then that's completely different. And I think like we, we've already said, one way forward mm -hmm. is to make sure to at least in terms of the rollout is to start with using AD facilities that are just processing a single source of waste that tends to that is is vegetable or plant based. And then there isn't actually a problem. Yeah, and, and uh, in addition, maybe uh, Eric can also uh, uh, talk about it. But from what we understood is, uh, even if you use plants, uh, most of the time you need the the, the manure or something to initiate the, the the digestion, and then still you 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 will stay. So you need to find a way to uh, get started just with uh, plant uh, for your digestate. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Another question is about um, protein uh, content of the algal biomass. And um, so, I don't know, Raul, are you here in, uh, in the audience here? Yes. Yeah. Can you please comment on the question about um, seasonal variation and uh, composition of high uh, level of protein if it's constant, remain constant during the cultivation process? Uh, yes, so we did um, conduct the seasonal variation analysis and we found very minimal differences across the three different seasons uh, that we characterize the biomass. So hardly any variation, which is a good news, but uh, we need to bear in mind this is done in the greenhouse, which is still under control conditions with minor fluctuations like the light and the temperature varies across the different seasons. But the composition analysis showed clearly that there is hardly any variation for uh, our pilot site. So uh, we can confidently say the composition is consistent. Okay, thank you, Raul. And um, uh, Lindsay, are you here, the speaker? Yeah, Lindsay, I have uh, one question to you. It seems that there is some cost figures involved in downstream processing for biomass harvest in drying. Just wonder is the price range for the target algae biomass as raw material for animal feed productions? Can you comment on it, this please? Uh, yes, so I think we're, we're still awaiting some of the, the kind of final results for, for downstream processing. Um, I think some of the, the figures that we'd captured from our partners throughout the, pro, uh, the project, um, we were looking at around about uh, 300 euros per tonne for the biomass as it was, but obviously as you extract the various high value products, the, the, the value increases um, so I think we were, were looking at a value of uh, one euro per tonne for um, high quality proteins, um, 20 euros per tonne for DHAs and 10 to 12 euros per tonne for peptides. I don't know whether that is consistent with, with um, the findings from, from other parts of the project, but that's, that's what we're, we were looking at at the moment. Um, obviously, we, we're still collecting data, so we will be refining that data as we go along. All right, thank you, Lindsay. And some question about uh, microfiltration. So like I presented my presentation, then we, we use uh, this pre-filtering pre step to um, reduce contamination again and just clear up um, digestate um, to prevent the this contamination grow after that in algal biomass as well. So all this detail was published already. So um, um, type of membranes and on each different site is also um, um, available for the best uh, practice documents. So it's will be it's a, please check our website on this. So um, Christine, how much time we have? Sorry, I'm a bit lost with time. I just tried to rush a little bit, but to to make it um, up to the time. But we still have some question and I thank you very much uh, already some partners answer like Jay from Belgium and some others specifically for their um, nitrogen balancing and for the contamination and Alistan as well. So again, I remind you then we will have um, question and answer session or more discussion session after this um, uh, in, in a format you know, just again, a breakout room. So please join this uh, related to the topic, what you would like to discuss with partners from the Algaity project. 
So um, I would like to thank you all for being so active and um, speakers and participants as well. We have really short video right now to show you. And um, after this, we will return to the main um, uh, room uh, uh, after coffee break as well.